when it comes to alien beings, extra dimensional beings, cryptids, apparitions, there seems to be a divide between those who feel the intent or motive of these beings is benevolent and those who feel it is malevolent. This is not something new to humans. We have always lived in a world where people have had encounters with such beings and we have always just accepted that this is something that some people will continue to encounter or experience. Human beings can barely understand the psychology and inner workings of other humans, let alone a being that inhabits a different realm. How many of them are there? How many extra dimensional beings, ghosts, apparitions, aliens, cryptids? How many of these beings do we have on a list? How many do we have cataloged? Too many to keep track of, that's how many. Here's another question. How many of those beings are said to have some sort of psychic ability? Almost all of them. When a certain group or individual manifests itself and frequents a specific person or place, that is what we call a haunting. And there are those out there who willingly and consensually open themselves up to these entities. Some of these people are well aware of what they are doing and understand the risk very well. Most do not. And the ones who do not wonder why down the line they find their life in ruin. They get sick often, have night sweats, nightmares, visions, bad things often happen to them and or other people they know. Not to mention the mental and emotional deterioration. All dark things resulting from a being that claims to be a light bearer. So what we are going to do is discuss one of these beings that has taken quite an interesting form among others. A being that has developed both a good and bad reputation. Another being that has deceived the minds of many. The Mantis. How many of you know what automatism is? This is when a person automatically behaves a certain way that they deny is within their control. Now channeling spirit guides, psychic mediums, this is nothing new and I want to explain this so that we have a better understanding of what this is. Simply put, channeling is communication with spirits. Prophets, shaman, witch doctors, psychic mediums, and the like claim to be able to receive information, messages, voices from the spirit world and often open themselves up as vessels for these entities to possess and speak through. The idea here is that these spirits have profound knowledge of the cosmos and universe, special information that could help guide them and others along their spiritual journey. Another part to channeling is that people claim it opens your mind to expand your consciousness. Thus you reach a higher level of spiritual consciousness. This comes down to meditation and reaching out to the spirit world to let in whoever. Whoever or whatever wants to communicate. People write entire books not as themselves but as the beings they are channeling. Some people are quite famous for this even a few celebrities over the years. They sell seminars, DVDs, television shows, which is all good because many people just see this as a form of harmless entertainment, and I get it. This is not about the ethics of the profession. It is about understanding. Almost every bit of information that is put out by a channeler is subjective in that there is no evidence that can prove whether the information presented 
is provided by a spirit, extra dimensional being, or the channeler themselves. So you can only really take the information provided at face value. How many have noticed that there is often this common mystical theme of unity, love, universal consciousness and truths, God, our future and purpose? You hear it all the time. The star seed, the star child, the rainbow being, the light being, the crystal being. It's like they all read out of the same manual, right? But the information is almost always contradictory when it comes to others who are claiming to channel the same type of beings from the same realm. In other words, just like a doctor, if you go to five different psychics, they are each going to tell you something different. Or that completely contradicts the last piece of information you received. Even if these people are truly in contact with otherworldly beings, we should all know that these beings are absolutely capable of lying. The channeler should be able to obtain information from a being that is unique and only known by that being. Tell me folks, what is the value of a mantis being that only provides information a human could come up with on the fly? The majority of the people, by the way, are women. Why? Because fallen angels and demons like women. I don't know what else to tell you, except that women tend to be more feminine, nurturing, and open to these quote-unquote new age ideas. You know, automatism is linked with dissociation. In other words, a person can meditate and any thought or idea that randomly pops into their head, they may think that it is a message or information coming from somewhere outside their own mind. So they can't even discern whether the information they receive is coming from a spirit or their own mind. And due to the fact that none of the info can be verified, I think most people are pretty good at taking the information with a grain of salt. Besides, some of these channelers have been proven to be frauds. Those are usually the people who just want to make money anyways. There's nothing complex to understand there. A lot of times the ones who are scammers will claim that someone is possessed. and They will charge exorbitant sums of money to exercise the demon. Isn't it interesting that one of the most unsettling alien species or extra dimensional beings are also the ones promoting themselves as light breeders? Here to illuminate you. You know, like that guy uh, Lucifer, right? I've already mentioned before that these fallen angels do not want to be seen as monsters. They gravitate towards beautiful forms and often want to be seen as light beings, light bearers or bringers. Yet they sometimes appear to people as these shadow beings, mantis beings, the Zeta. This is a psychological trick. This is all to give the impression to the channeler that they have knowledge and power that is not human. Do you see? It is to give off the quality of otherness, to give the impression that they are definitely alien. In mythology, the mantid is found in Native American and African folklore. They are sometimes described as the first living creature on earth. Some say they come from the Draco star system, that they were working with the reptilians. They are credited with giving life to humans and animals, language and fire. They are even credited for bringing us the moon. They say they are six to seven feet tall, sometimes even taller with thin torsos and extra joints. Their heads are insect-like and triangular with large slanted dark eyes. They are either dark brown, green, or black, with an exoskeleton that sometimes is coated with a oily substance. They are often described as wearing long robes of different colors. Some don't wear clothing at all. They are of course psychic, communicating with people telepathically while communicating among themselves, sometimes with clicking and grunting sounds. Now, 
For some reason, these beings also have the ability to shape shift or are able to create a field around them so that they can appear human. They also use small gray aliens to do work for them. And we have heard about that with other alien species, right? They also abduct people and engage in human DNA harvesting. And they believe that these beings run a human mantis hybridization program. Of course they are. Of course they would be involved in the genetic manipulation of humans. What else is new? Speaking of which, do you want to know something? What if I told you that they have in the past tried to create human-insect hybrids for the simple purpose of creating a human with a biological built-in exoskeleton, something that they could use for a super soldier. Some would describe these beings as the tall blacks with orange-red glowing eyes. Now I'm talking about real human scientists in a lab trying to create human-insect chimera, not spiritual beings, fleshly beings. So what about the encounters? Well, there are multiple, multiple stories about these beings. One of the more famous stories comes from David Huggins. Renee Rose writes, The Strange Life of David Huggins, on the website medium.com, no less. Huggins was raised in Georgia, where at the age of eight, he started to have encounters with alien beings. The first was a small hairy being with yellow glowing eyes. Rose writes, Apparently this being spoke to him, demanding his attention, saying, David, behind you. From this point on, Huggins claims to have had multiple instances of contact with otherworldly beings, such as an insect-like entity that he claims looks similar to a praying mantis. And, of course, your ever-popular greys. Here comes the part you've all been waiting for. When Huggins hits 17, he recalls walking along a wooden path not far from his property. After walking for a bit, he happens upon the alien that he has destined to get down and dirty with. Huggins describes this alien woman as remarkably similar to the typical human form of female from the neck down. If you're having a hard time visualizing all of this, I'm about to make your day. Or maybe not. Huggins is an avid, talented artist. He's a painter, in fact. When you're gifted with such talents in life, they should be embraced and exerted, right? Huggins certainly thought so. Um, a little warning for one I'm about to include here, I guess. Erotic art ahead? If weird alien on human sex is your thing, you are both in the right place and hard for me to relate to. No judgment, just not my thing. She writes that Huggins called this being Crescent and that nothing was said between them. They just saw each other and took their clothes off. No conversation, no nothing. Just wham, bam, thank you, Mantis. I guess for some lonely folks out there that would count as a good encounter, except for that Huggins said that it hurt. And I'm pretty sure she looked nothing like Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy. Of course, there are accounts of attacks from these insect beings that materialize and dematerialize at will. One of the victims, let's call him Jim, tells of his encounters, saying that he has seen them sitting by his bed at night. He says they come often to mutilate and decapitate his horses, and as a result, he would shoot at them or hack them up with a machete. He said his wife would come home often seeing him mopping up blood. I don't know about you guys, but if I was his wife, I don't think I'd be coming home again after a few episodes of that. To me, these are the same beings I've always talked about. The Fallen. They have the same MO. And the only real difference here is that they have a different form. Otherwise, they all do the same things. Over and and over again. I'm sure we will get more into this in our next discussion about alien beings, especially insectoids. Be sure to hit the like button if you haven't already. Also, if you would 
like to be notified of a new release, please hit the notification bell and turn on YouTube notifications. Check out woodwardentertainment.com and visit the Woodward Entertainment store for all your WTV merchandise. Until next time, folks, as always, stay awake, stay aware, stay safe, and I'll talk to you all soon.